So let's invite Pratush to the stage, who's going to be, as mentioned, talking about SNARKs for polynomial commitments. Char going into uncharted territory, it sounds like. I'm very excited <laughs> to hear this. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thanks, Anna. Excited to be here. So yeah, so as uh, Nick said, we'll be uh, looking at constructing SNARKs from polynomial commitments, which is sort of a very recent paradigm for constructing uh, SNARKs compared especially to like the hash-based SNARKs, which go back to the 90s. All right, okay. So let's, before we dive into um, our construction, let's quickly recall <clears throat> IOPs um, from Ali's talk, right? So in this model, you have a prover and a verifier. The prover has uh, the public input and the witness and the verifier has uh, just the public input. And the prover and verifier exchange some messages. The prover's messages are some arbitrary bit strings, right? They're just some oracles. Uh, and the verifier's messages are just some uh, randomness, right? So yeah, basically the prover and verifier interact over some sequence of T rounds. And at the end, um, the verifier can generate a query set to uh, query the so it'll ask for the value of the Oracle at a particular location. And it'll take the result of um, these queries and plug it into a decision procedure and then decide whether or not to accept, right? So this is a, you know, it, it looks like a fine model, something to consider. Um, but, you know, why have IOPs been useful? Um, and to answer that, we can, let's take a look inside common IOPs, right? So what, what is the underlying te te technique uh, behind common IOPs? Okay, and the answer, uh, spoiler alert, is polynomials. Everything in crypto is polynomials, so it's no surprise that we have polynomials here as well. So in particular, um, inside IOP, uh, most common IOPs, such as stocks or Aurora, or you know, basically anything that you could um, you know, really want to implement, um, the prover messages are supposed to be polynomial encodings, right? And the verifier queries are, um, evaluation point. So the verifier is asking what is the evaluation of say P1 at a point Z1, something like that, right? And it's okay, so the message is supposed to be polynomials. Uh, and then to actually enforce that they are polynomials, uh, most IOPs also include what's called the low degree test, which, yeah, as I said, ensures that the messages are actual polynomials of a specified degree. Okay, so this is really nice. Um, but, you know, it's not quite satisfactory. Because what happens is that when we do these low degree tests, even the best ones that we have today, for example, um, the Fry low degree test, uh, they're quite expensive. Um, they require a logarithmic number of rounds in the degree of the polynomials. Um, and they result in a lot of queries um, because the verifier also has to query, um, has to query these polynomials at many, at many locations, okay? All right, um, so this is a problem, right? What can we do about it? What if we just get rid of the low degree test entirely, right? What if we just assume that messages are polynomials instead of you know, having to test for that? So this leads to this recent model called uh, polynomial IOP, which was introduced within the last couple of years. Um, and in here you have, as in sort of the standard IOP model, you have the prover and the verifier and the prover and verifier exchange some messages. But now we uh, sort of just assume that the prover messages are polynomials, right? And they can be whatever, you know, for a particular kind of polynomial IOP, they can be you know, multivariate polyno polynomials, univariate polynomials over different kinds of bases, coefficient, monomial, whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, they just are polynomials, right? And then the query set is still as before, um, some set of evaluation points. <clears throat> evaluation points. So the verifier, it queries P1 at a point Z1, PT at a point ZT and so on, right? And then based on uh, the, you know, the results of these evaluations, it makes some decision. So this is basically the same as the IOP model, except we don't have any LDTs, right? We just assume that the uh, prover messages are polynomials. So, I mean, this is like a I mean, relatively strong assumption, but we'll see how to, you know, why this is useful uh, in just a bit. Okay. Um, so let's see how, you know, like what this restriction does in terms of uh, you know, how it allows us to change the properties of these polynomial IOPs compared to um, standard IOPs. So from a completeness perspective, um, what we, what the guarantee that we want is that there is, whenever sort of the prover is honest and it actually knows the correct witness, it, it can uh, get a strategy that always outputs only polynomials. So the messages are, all, are only polynomials, right? And the verifier will accept these polynomial messages. 
in comparison in the IOP, the prover can output like an arbitrary bit string, right? It doesn't have to be a polynomial. Uh, and similarly, um, in the soundness case, what we want is that whenever the verifier accepts, um, we will only consider adversarial provers um, that output polynomials. So we don't consider provers which output arbitrary bit strings. We only want soundness uh, against provers which output polynomials, right? And against these sort of algebraic provers which output polynomials, we're able to construct extractors which find the secret witness. Okay, so you know, there's been a lot of work. So this is like a useful model, and there's been a lot of work over the past uh, you know, three, four years on constructing uh, PIP constructions, which have different kinds of uh, you know, prover efficiency, verifier efficiency, uh, and you know, support different kinds of computations. Um, <clears throat> and they use a variety of very interesting underlying techniques, such as univariate and multivariate sum checks, uh, product checks, permutation checks, lookup tables. And there's a you know, huge world of interesting techniques um, that uh, you know, underlie efficient PIP constructions, all right? And so they seem to provide like a strong foundation if you can construct a snark for them, right? Because then your snark will maybe inherit some of these properties or interesting properties. Okay, so how do you actually get a snark from a PIOP, right? Let's try to see um, how to do this uh, by taking inspiration from the IOP to snark compiler that Nick just covered, right? So let's see if we can look in, look for lessons there to construct our PIOP to snark compiler. All right, so in this IOP to snark compiler, you have an IOP plus a vector commitment, uh, like a Merkle tree. Um, this is just a generalization of Merkle trees, right? Um, and then you can get a snark. And the rough strategy, uh, I won't recap it in detail, is you have the snark prover. It'll run the IOP prover and commit to the um, oracles, the you know vectors or bit strings that the IOP prover produces. Um, and then uh, it'll you know, generate the queries and prove that the sort of query locations in the committed uh, oracles uh, is uh, or like the values are correct using some sort of opening proof. So in the Merkle tree case, you will provide a sort of authentication path. Um, there's other vector commitments with different sort of opening proofs. And then sort of the snark verifier, it'll run the uh, IOP verifier, and also it'll check that the uh, opening proofs are correct, that the Merkle tree paths are correct, for example. Okay. So, okay, so for this to work, what we need from our vector commitment is we need to be able to succinctly commit to the vector, right? And then we need to be able to provide a short proof that the, uh, you know, of the commitment opening, the local opening, right? So in the Merkle tree case, the succinct commitment is the, is the root and the uh, sort of opening proof is the Merkle tree path, which is logarithmic in the size of the Oracle. Right. So, okay, so for, for these I, for IP to snark compilers, we you know, understand it well. Let's try to see what happens when we move to the PIOP world. Right. So now we have a polynomial IOP, and we want some kind of commitment scheme, which gives us maybe like a similar structure for our final snark. So we want to be able to commit to the polynomials that are output by the PIOP prover, prove that they are correctly evaluated at some challenge points. Um, so we want an evaluation proof. And then the Snark verifier needs to be able to check this evaluation proof, right, efficiently. So similarly here, we want we need to be, now instead of committing to a vector, we will need to commit to a polynomial. And then we want to open the commitment um, at arbitrary evaluation points, right? Okay, so this gives us like a list of uh, you know, a couple of properties that we want from our uh, sort of question mark, question mark, question mark commitment. So let's see what how we can fill in this blank, right? And it seems that basically what we want is a polynomial commitment. So what are these? So polynomial commitment um, <coughs> has a few different algorithms. First, you do a setup, um, which takes in some degree, maximum supported degree of the polynomials that you want to support with your PC scheme. And it outputs like a committing key and a verifying key. And then the sender and receiver, these are two parties, um, they interact using three algorithms. The sender is, uses uh, the commitment scheme, the commit algorithm inside the PC scheme, to commit to its polynomial, right? Um, it gets this commitment, sends this over to the receiver, and the receiver then responds with a challenge point and asks, hey, sender, can you, you know, prove to me 
can you tell me what the evaluation of the committed polynomial is at this challenge point, z? Uh, and can you also prove that that's correct, right? So what the standard does is it evaluates the, po uh, the polynomial at this point, and then it produces an opening proof that the committed polynomial at the point z actually evaluates to the point to the value v, right? And this gives a sort of um, an evaluation proof, which the sender sends to the receiver, and the receiver can then check uh, this evaluation proof um, against the point and the original commitment. Okay, so basically all we're doing at a high level in the polynomial commitment is we commit to a polynomial, and then later on <clears throat> we're able to provide a short evaluation proof that the committed polynomial evaluates to some claimed value v at the challenge point z. So that's the property that we want from a polynomial commitment. And uh, we want completeness and extractability, which is a sort of standard properties, um, so that whenever uh, the sort of sender is acting honestly, that it actually, you know, this evaluation claim is, is true, that the committed polynomial evaluates to v at the point z, then the receiver accepts, and we want extractability which basically just says that uh, whenever the receiver accepts, the, the sender actually knows inside the, uh, the, the commitment sent by the sender actually contains a polynomial that is of the appropriate degree D, okay? And which sort of agrees with the evaluation claim that the committed polynomial actually, you know, has this relation, P of Z equals V. Okay, so this is like a mouthful, but basically we just, you know, uh, want to commit to a polynomial and then prove that its evaluation is correct later on. Okay, so this is like the most basic definition of a polynomial commitment. You can consider more, I guess, complex definitions where you commit to multiple polynomials at the same time, and then you open them at a query set instead of a single point. Uh, and this actually leads to big efficiency improvements, sort of this batch commitment and batch opening property, which we'll see when we get to our um, construction of a snark from these PC schemes. Okay, so I mean, I've talked about this definition of a polynomial commitment, but can we actually, you know, realize these via efficient constructions? And the answer is yes. Uh, basically, over the past 10 years, there's been a number of constructions which achieve, uh, you know, which are based on different underlying assumptions, such as pairings, uh, you know, groups of unknown order, discrete log, whatever, um, and which have different kinds of prover and verifier efficiency and proof sizes. Uh, as well as these homomorphism and batching properties, right? So this is just like a, this table is a, you know, high level overview of maybe the state of the art, or most popular PC schemes, right? Um, and they, as you see, they, they achieve different kinds of properties in terms of setup, you know, commitment size, proof size, verifier time, and so on. All right, okay. Um, and the interesting thing is by sort of, you know, these different PC schemes, when we sort of plug them into our construction of SNARKs from these PC schemes, this will sort of the SNARK will inherit the properties uh, of this PC scheme. So, for example, if your PC scheme has a private setup, then your SNARK will have a private setup. If it has a public setup, it'll have a public one. Um, yeah, and so on. Okay, so this is like a summary of PC schemes, right? Um, Let's see how we can actually now combine these PC schemes with the PIOPs that we saw earlier to get a snark. Right. So, okay, so as we saw, so as a, if you recall, a snark has three algorithms. You have a setup algorithm, uh, which outputs the proving and verification key, and you have a prover and a verifier. So let's see how all of these algorithms work in our construction, okay? So in setup, what we do is we'll take in sort of the maximum size of the computation that we want to support. So let's say we want to, you know, prove a snark for a circuit of size 100 gates, right? So I'll plug in 100 into the setup. And this will tell me sort of the max degree that is required by the, that the, sort of the polynomial oracles have. So what is the maximum degree of the oracles output by the prover? And then we'll do our setup to invoke this. And we'll get out like some commitment key and verification key, and we'll set set these to be the prover and verifier keys for our snark. Okay, I mean you don't have to know too much. Basically, we just output committing uh, prover and verifier verifier keys which support um, the maximum circuit size, for example, that we want to uh, use with our snark, prove with our snark. Okay, um, <clears throat> so how does our so, so we want to construct our prover and verifier? 
And what these will do is at a high level, they will invoke inside them the PIOP prover and the PIOP verifier. So the, the SNARK prover will run the, the PIOP prover. It'll obtain the first polynomial oracle, and then it will commit to this using the PC commit algorithm. It will send this commitment to the SNARK verifier. So OK, so I guess before you know, we get too deep, uh, we'll first dis uh, discuss the sort of interactive protocol. And then basically, you can just apply Fiat Shamir to make it non-interactive. So it's similar to um, the situation in Nick's talk. OK, so just for simplicity, I'll just talk about the interactive case here first. Right, so as you were saying, um, the prover commits to the first polynomial oracle output by the PIOP prover. Um, <clears throat> and then the SNARK verifier invokes the PIOP verifier to get the randomness. And this continues for you know, the key rounds in the PIOP. And sort of then you, we are done. And then what the, uh, what the SNARK prover does is that it generates the query set that corresponds to the randomness sent by the verifier. Right? And then it opens the committed polynomials at this query set using the PC open um, algorithm. Right? And this results in some evaluation proof and some corresponding evaluations, which are plugged into the, <clears throat> uh, the PIOP decision and the PC check algorithms. Um, and if both of these accept, then the SNARK verifier as a whole accepts. Okay. So we commit to the oracles, and then the prover also provides an opening proof at the query set, and the verifier checks the evaluations as well as the opening proof, right? So the high-level structure, as we saw before, is very similar to the Killian um, setting, right? And then plus you can apply Fiat Shamir to get non-interactivity. And I won't really go into like the soundness and completeness errors or properties, but basically in the interactive case, um, the soundness error is basically the soundness error of the of the uh, PIOP and plus the soundness error of the PC scheme. Right? And similarly for the prover and verifier efficiencies. And uh, okay, all right. Okay, so this is a construction, right? I mean, it's, it looks like a useful construction, but does it actually solve the problem that we set out to solve all the way in the beginning of my talk? And the problem was uh, of large proof sizes, right? So if you remember. <coughs> as well as from Nick's talk, that um, these IOP-based NARCs, they have large proof sizes. So let's compare um, the proof size of our construction, this PIOP-based construction, with that of the IOP-based SNARC. Okay? So we'll start off with an asymptotic, asymptotic comparison. right? So first, the proof consists of the commitments to the oracles. right? And this is the same in both, usually. Um, you have T commitments for T oracles. right? And then you have uh, sort of the values of the oracles at the query set, right? So you have these. these this also looks looks at the first glance, at the first glance the same, right? And then the part that is mostly different is the sort of opening proofs, right? Uh, in the, for example, in the Merkle tree based IOP based SNARK, right? Um, the opening proof consists of authentication paths. So if there are Q queries, then you have Q authentication paths, right? Um, so this is sort of where that size comes in. And the PIOP based case, you have uh, opening proof, um, which I won't expand. It depends on the PC scheme, right? OK, so this is the sort of asymptotic expression. But what does it look like for concrete SNARKs, right? So as we saw in Nick's talk, for fry based IOPs like Aurora or Stark, um, as well as you know recent iterations on those, the argument size is 100 kilobytes, right? In comparison, if you take a state-of-the-art univariate PIOP, such as Planck or Marlin, um, or you know, recent uh, improvements on those, then what you'll find is that if you plug in, for example, the bulletproofs-based PC scheme, then you get a much smaller proof size of 5 kilobytes. And if you're OK with using pairing assumptions, then if you use the KCG PC scheme, then you get down to just 600 bytes. Right? That's less than a kilobyte. That's absolutely tiny. So it's like an order of couple of orders of magnitude difference from the Fry-based uh, IOP snark, right? OK, why is this, uh, why is this the case, right? Because just from this table, it doesn't seem that it's not apparent why that should be the case. Well, there's two reasons. First, recall that in the IOP case, you have to do a low degree test, right? 
And this results in a lot of queries to the various oracles, right? And this means that the query set for the IOP case is much larger. There's a lot more sort of queries in there compared to the PIOP case. So concretely, for example, in Planck and Marlin, there's only two evaluation points. The query set consists of just two field elements, right? Whereas it, it can be much higher in the IOP based case. So this means that sort of this contribution, um, the Oracle values, that's already much larger, okay? Then um, in the, the second reason is that for many polynomial commitments, um, the evaluation proof can be much smaller um, than sort of the, even the you know, number of commitments and the query set size, right? So for example, in the KZG case, um, the evaluation proof, if you, even if you're sort of you know, pro proving the evaluation of a, say 100 committed polynomials, the final evaluation proof, uh, if you're evaluating at the same point, all these polynomials, you only require one group element, right? Whereas sort of in the IOP based case, you would need to have 100 different authentication paths, right, for each query. And there's also this amplification arising from the sort of the query set size, right? So both of these factors put together, one and two, results in this massive difference in the proof size, right? So it seems that, you know, after all this work, our final construction actually has achieved what we set out to do, which is get a snack with a smaller proof size, right? Um, yeah, so basically that sort of wraps up this construction, right? So we've seen how to construct SNARKs from polynomial IOPs and PC schemes, uh, and these are efficient and have much smaller argument size than IOP-based SNARKs, which is a positive. But on the downside, they usually rely on some more structured cryptography, such as pairings and discrete logs and groups of unknown order. And as Nick pointed out, these tend to not um, be quantum resistant, right? And we know they're not quantum resistant for many uh, of these PC schemes. So if you want to use these, you know, on a hundred years down the line, maybe, you know, think about what kind of assumptions you're okay with. All right, so this sort of concludes the first part of the talk, right? We saw uh, you know, about the, how to get a smaller argument size. But what we haven't seen so far is how to achieve sublinear verification for IOP and PIOP based SNARKs, right? By sublinear verification, I mean that the verifier runs in time that is smaller than the size of the computation. So if you have a circuit, the verifier should not run you know, linearly in the circuit size, but maybe sublinear square root or logarithmic, something like that, right? And Ale alluded, alluded to this in his talk, but we'll quickly go over um, you know, why, you know, what's the, you know, why this is a separate topic on its own. Okay, so let's take a look at the, complex, the verifier complexity in these PIP-based snarks. So in the rest of this talk, I'll sort of abstract um, you know, both PIOPs and IOPs into just some IOP, okay? Because the material is common to both. All right. Um, right, so this is the sort of expression the, for the running time of the verifier, right? The time for the SNARK verifier is roughly equal to the time for the check algorithm, for checking the Merkle tree path, or checking the evaluation proof, you know, whatever, plus the time for the IOP verifier, right? We know how to make this portion small, right? In the Merkle tree, verifying the path is logarithmic. In KCG, you just require to do one pairing, for example. Um, so we know how to make this succinct. What about this, right? What about the IOP verification cost? So let's take a look at what happens in uh, you know, your IOP. You have some oracles and the verifier makes some queries. So nothing changed. But what actually happens is that this public input X can actually be divided into two parts. One is the description of the computation F. So for example, the circuit, um, the description of the circuit, right? Or the description of uh, your algorithm, right? And, oh, where did it go? And the actual input um, X, right? So the actual public input to the, the public input to the circuit, for example, right? Um, so the problem, so what this means is that the IOP verifier has to at least read, you know, even if it doesn't do anything else with F, let's say, it, it, it at least has to read F, right? Um, and, you know, when the size of F is much less than the size of the computation, example in machine computations, then this is, this is fine because this time can be sublinear, right? So you know, if you, for example, think of doing the same hash function a hundred times, right? The description of the computation, 
is just the description of the hash function. But the size of the computation is, you know, 100 times the hash function computation. So, you know, this condition holds, right? And then in that case, you know, we know how to achieve sub sort of, sort of sublinear verification. And the verify will run in time only in the sort of description of the hash function, not in the, you know, 100 times the hash function. OK. But, you know, if you have an arbitrary circuit, which consists of, you know, many different components all, you know, mashed together, then the size of the function description is actually equal to the size of the computation, in this case, the circuit size, right? And so far in this model, um, the verifier will run linear in the, you know, in the size of f or in the size of the circuit, which kind of sucks, right? Because a lot of applications of SNOCs, you know, rely on having some sort of sublinear verification. Okay, so to resolve this, um, recently a new model was proposed, which extends IOPs and PIOPs with what's called holography. So I won't, you know, explain the uh, why it's called holography, but basically the idea is that we introduce a new algorithm that first pre-processes the circuit, right? And then the yeah, so we call this okay. So you have your sort of standard prover and verifier. So this is unchanged. But there's also a new algorithm called an indexer or a preprocessor, which takes in the circuit C and outputs a set of oracles, which is different from the prover oracles, right? That somehow encode the circuit, right? And then, oh, and the verifier, as before, it can access, it can query the prover oracles, but it can also query the indexer oracles, right? This oracle which corresponds to the circuit. And notice that now it is not reading the circuit, it's not taking the circuit as input at all, right? And so this means that it can be sublinear. If it's only making, let's say, you know, a logarithmic number of queries total in the circuit size, then the verifier can potentially be sublinear, right? So just in this model, what we've done is sort of, <clears throat> we've sort of removed C from the input to the verifier. And instead, we've sort of pre-processed it and given the verifier Oracle access to an encoding of C, right? OK, so that's the sort of this uh, generalization of PIOPs. Let's see how we can go from these, um, I guess, not PC schemes, but uh, yeah, from some commitment scheme to a pre-processing snark, right? So if you recall in pre-processing snark, we want to sort of pre-process the um, the circuit in some way, right? And that's exactly what PIPs enable, uh, these holographic PIPs enable. Okay, so we have our setup algorithm, right? Um, and it's similar to before, except now um, we uh, yeah, output public parameters um, for you know, any supported size n, right? And just as a note, I guess OC here denotes Oracle commitment, right? So it can be a vector commitment, it can be a polynomial commitment, it can be some other kind of commitment if you have a different kind of IOP. I'm just sort of abstracting that away for the moment, OK? Then the new algorithm, the indexer, what happens here is that you run the IOP indexer, OK? And you get out some oracles which correspond to the circuit. And then you commit to these using your Oracle commitment, right? And now you have a commitment to some encoding of the circuit. And you plug this into the verifier key. So the verifier key consists of you know, the public parameters. Uh, what I was in the universal parameters, as well as this commitment to the uh, circuit or the encoding of the circuit. And then the prover and verifier look almost the same, except that um, this query set can contain queries to the uh, circuit oracles, right, or the indexer oracles. And so the prover has to answer queries to those oracles too inside oc.open, right? So it produces an evaluation proof for those, um, for queries to the circuit oracles as well. And then you can, you can apply fiat um in the standard way to get non-attractivity. Okay, so yeah, basically it's the high level idea is that instead of um, having the verify take the circuit as input, we sort of encode it and commit to it in a succinct way and then prove that accesses to the committed um, encoding are correct, okay? Let's see how this uh, leads to an improvement in the verifier complexity. So what we've done now is, you know, we already knew how to make this portion succinct, the Oracle commitment check, right? That part is already succinct. And what we've done is we've now made the IOP verifier also succinct by leveraging holography. So as a whole, this means that now the SNARK verifier can also be sublinear, right? 
And yeah, so the, and now we have this new technique of holography, which enables sublinear verification for arbitrary circuit computations. OK, awesome. so that sort of wraps up uh, my presentation. So in this talk, uh, you know, we looked at PIOPs and PC schemes. There's lots of exciting future directions. We want to reduce the proof of memory. That's you know, currently, unfortunately, a big bottleneck in deploying these. And by reducing the polynomial degree, we can get better uh, prover time. And holography is also super not super cheap yet. Um, uh, and the PC scheme front, you know, we want to maybe construct um, construction uh, achieve constructions that uh, are efficient, but from new assumptions such as lattices. Um, we want to improve uh, the constructions that we do know from existing assumptions, uh, like discrete law. Maybe you know, let's try to achieve succinct verification, um, as well as you know, uh, new applications. So, for example, recently there's been uh, constructions of efficient recursive snacks that rely on this new notion of accumulation for both PC schemes as well as IOPs and polynomial IOPs, right? So maybe there's more applications that um, can pop up, right? So yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. That wraps up my talk. Very cool. Thank you so much, Pratush. I'm wondering, I mean, there's been incredible conversation happening in the comments. Oh, wow, 46 comments. Yeah, there's been a lot. But I don't know if it'll be easy to find a question. OK, here's a question. I don't know if this is if this okay. needs some context. Um, oh, it just disappeared. Hold on a second. Yeah. I know Susanna's looking for some good ones in the chats. All right, there we go. Yeah. There's so yeah, this question. Yeah, basically that's the idea. So instead of ha instead of testing that the oracle is low degree uh, or is a polynomial via low degree test, we just require the polynomial commitment to enforce that. Um, so for example, in the KCG case, your commitment, uh, you know, you, basically you're evaluating a polynomial at the SRS in some sense, right? Um, and the extractability property of your polynomial commitment scheme means that uh, no matter what the prover sense, if it makes a verifier accept, then there is sort of some polynomial that is underlying the prover's commitment. Um, so you can always sort of, you know, no matter what the prover is actually doing, like you can always take its messages and get a polynomial out. Whereas in the sort of standard IOP case, you would have to do a low degree test to enforce that. Very cool. Um, yeah, so okay, so you can chunk and split polynomials. So this is a good question. Um, this does increase the proof size because you know, if you are you want to support really large degree polynomials, then you would have to commensurately commit to each chunk, right? Um, and also, you know, it doesn't really maybe apply as much to things like the two transparent PC schemes. Uh, it's mostly a restriction for um, like KCG based schemes where you have a trusted setup which only supports polynomials up to a specific uh, degree. But yeah, you can do this chunking, it just results in an increase of proof size um, that corresponds to the number of chunks. Yeah, the theoretical difference is just that um, in IOPs, the messages can be some arbitrary strings. In PIOPs, the messages have to be polynomials, they can't be um, anything else. Um, yeah, they, we just assume that. Okay, well, I think we're actually at time. So thank you so much, Pratush, for answering those questions. Um, and yeah, I guess if there's more questions, you know where the comments section is. So um, maybe we'll hear a bit more from you over there too.